Today, we're going to be dealing with Saviors in the Tanakh Part 3. We're going to be talking about Joseph. So what's interesting about Joseph is Joseph was actually prophesied to rule. Genesis 37 and 9 says, then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, look, I have dreamed another dream. And this time, the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowed down to me. Now we know Joseph was a prophet because we see in Numbers 12 and 6, and he said, hear now my words, if there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known to him in a vision, and I will speak unto him in a dream. Everybody knows Joseph was an interpreter of dreams. He had these dreams that bothered his brothers, and uh, they really had no idea that they were about to help this uh, come to pass, to actually help him be a savior, as I'm going to show you that Joseph was a savior. He's not known for that. Joseph is known to, you know, interpret the dreams and, you know, be a viceroy to Pharaoh. Even though the text clearly says it, if you ask the average person, Joseph is not known as a savior. But even before this, here's an interesting verse in um, Genesis 37, 21 and 22. But Reuben heard it and he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit, which is in the wilderness and do not lay a hand on him that he might deliver him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. So Reuben had the intention to save Joseph. So Reuben was trying to actually be a savior to the savior <laughs> in so many words. So again, throughout these, le these lessons, we're going to see that the concept of salvation is physical and in the time of trouble when we speak about saviors in the Tanakh. Now, we know there's a concept of spiritual salvation you, you repent, you get closer to God, people can look at that as salvation. You, you had, you know, a disease and you got healed, you had cancer, got healed, anything like that. You're going through something and there's light at the end of the tunnel and you, you come out victorious. That can also be salvation. But throughout the Tanakh, the saviors are always in a situation where somebody's in danger and they save them out of that time of trouble. And real quick, I want to tell a story about um, the other day. I was talking to a guy. He's a Christian, um, well-read, um, and I asked him, how many saviors are in the Tanakh? And he named about five, six saviors. He, he named Joseph. He named Abraham. Um, he named, uh, I want to say he said Samson. Uh, he named a few people, um, Joshua, Moses. So I said, okay. I said, so we see a pattern in the Tanakh of these saviors. I said, are there any saviors in the New Testament like these saviors in the Tanakh? And he said, no. And I was, I was kind of, I was a little shocked that, you know, of course, you're going to think he's going to say, of course, of course, Jesus. But he said, not like in the Tanakh. And I was like, that should be like a red flag that you can acknowledge that you see saviors in the Tanakh, but you don't see one in the New Testament. So how exactly is Jesus a savior? He said, well, he, his, his answer was he was born a savior. I said, so, but he didn't save anybody. So if you're not, but if you didn't win the Super Bowl, I can't, I can't call you a Super Bowl champion. You actually have to, you know, fill the job <laughs> description. So I just thought, thought it's interesting when you talk to people and you ask them these questions, name savers in the Tanakh and then ask them the name savers in the New Testament. And you're going to see, hopefully the wheels start spinning. So moving on, um, as we go through Genesis and, and we're dealing with the, the, the story of Joseph and his brothers, there's some interesting things that we could still learn some laws of Noah in, the, in, these, in, this, um, in these chapters. So in Genesis 39 and 9, it says, no one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? This is when um, Potiphar's wife is coming on to Joseph. And he actually was like, no, you're his wife and I'm not going to sin against God which is one of the laws of Noah, you know, the, the sexual morality. So even though they're not directly quoted as laws of Noah, when you read the text, you can see laws of Noah throughout the text. Genesis 20 and 3, if you go back a little bit, this is just to confirm the, the, the concept that was already known in, in this ancient world. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, behold, thou art but a dead man for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. 
So Joseph and his brothers knew this concept. Abimelech, who's not even an Israelite, knew the concept of adultery. So we know that this was prevalent in the ancient world. So when people try to tell you that the rabbis made up the laws of Noah, it's kind of ridiculous because they just they're just not reading the text. And in um, Proverbs six and thirty two, it says, "But he who he but who's committeth but whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understand understanding that he doesn't that he that does it destroys his own soul." So we see even when when the the kings of the world in the First Kings chapter four. All the kings of the earth came to Solomon to hear his wisdom. And I'm sure <laughs> this was one, one of the things he talked about. I'm sure he taught the seven laws of Noah, you know what I mean? And in probably a broader sense, of course, this is Solomon speaking. But even in the Proverbs, it talks about this, this thing about committing adultery. Even in the ancient world, everybody knew about it. So the laws of Noah have a very firm standing in the Tanakh, even though they're not expressed that way. So I just wanted to bring that out since we're dealing with uh, the book of Genesis still. And one of the things about Joseph, one, thing, one of the things that led to him being a viceroy is that he cared for somebody. He, he was concerned about how somebody was feeling. So when we go to Genesis 40, chapter five, or chapter Genesis 40, verse five and seven, it says, then the butler and the baker and the king of Egypt who were confined in the prison had a dream, both of them. Each man's dream in one night and each man's dream with its own interpretation. And Joseph came into them in the morning and looked at them and saw that they were sad. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in the custody of his Lord's house saying, why do you look so sad today? Because Joseph asked that question, he was able to interpret those dreams. And then one of those guys, the, the, um, the cupbearer, remembered Joseph eventually. And that's how Joseph ascended to, the, to be the vice, viceroy. So we see the concern for others propelled Joseph to be in that position. So this is another aspect of, you know, just common sense of um, when you look out for people, the most high looks out for you. So he didn't have to ask. He could have just been like, those, those, those guys look sad, but he actually asked them, what's wrong with you? And we can see that we should be concerned about others, even if we really don't know them. I mean, you don't have to go out of your way, but we, we see that when you care for people, it actually show, it, it, it makes a, a huge effect. And in that sense, instance, it made a huge effect on a lot of different people because when Joseph took that position, he was able to affect the, the a whole region of people. It says in Psalm 142 and four, look on my right hand and see, for there is no one who acknowledges me Refuge has failed me and no one cares for my soul. So the psalmist is feeling like nobody's caring for him. Even people who are in the, in the level that can write psalms can feel like nobody cares. So I'm sure he was around prophets. He was around other wise men, other rabbis. But for whatever reason, he felt like nobody cares for them. So we got to go out of our way sometimes to show people that we do care. People that's close around us. You know, even the strangers just saying hi to, to, to people can, can change somebody's day. Um, Proverbs 19, 17, who has, he who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord and he will pay back what he has given. This, of course, goes back to stock or a charity. That two or $3 that you give somebody while you're on the corner waiting on the light to change, that can be his only meal for the day. And, you know, that can change his perception on a lot of things. Some people just think nobody cares about me. Everybody been driving past me all day and you can be the one to uplift that person. So just something that we learned from, from Joseph caring about people. He didn't know where that was going to take him. He was in, he was just, he was in jail himself and just looked out for somebody asking about their, uh, their basically what's wrong, what's going on with your day. And it changed a lot of things. So um, if we continue in Genesis 44, verse eight and nine, we can talk about some more laws of Noah on the way. So it says, look, we brought back to you from the land of Canaan, the money which we found in the mouth of our sacks. Excuse me. <clears throat> How then could we steal silver or gold from your Lord's house? With whomever your servant it is found, let him die. And we will also be my Lord's slaves. Now we know in ancient times in the land of Israel under a baked dean, like, you know, 
a, a real Sanhedrin, the laws of Noah, some of them were, pun well, all of them were punishable by death. Um, they, they, basically, there's capital punishments. Um, and this was known to them. Why would they say, let him die? They didn't say, let him pay it back. It's almost like they already knew the punishment for somebody stealing. Um, Genesis 31 and 32, with whomever you find your gods, do not let him live. So Jacob said the same thing. If somebody stole something, if somebody stole something, he said, let them die. Let, do not let them live. Now, he didn't know Rachel had stolen them, but <laughs> we know what happened to Rachel. She died right after this. So even though these things are not known to a lot of people, the laws of Noah were definitely known to these people. And they, they, they knew, the, they even knew the consequences, you know? So um, I just wanted to bring that out as we go on through here. And what's interesting is when he said that, it happened, unfortunately. But one of the reasons that this could have happened, I'm not saying that this is why it happened, but this is what it says in um, Proverbs 10 and 24 about the words of the righteous. With the wicked dread will overtake them, what the righteous desire will be granted. So J Jacob basically said, if somebody's stolen from you, let them die. And unfortunately, Rachel died. We see the same thing when Isaac gave the blessing, Genesis 27 and 33. Then Isaac trembled exceedingly, exceedingly and said, who, where, is the one who hunted game and brought it to me. I ate all of it before you, I ate all of it before you came and I have blessed him and indeed he shall be blessed. So this just shows you Isaac knew that his blessing was gonna go through because he was righteous and it, it happened. You, he couldn't take it back. So the words of the righteous have a lot of weight behind them. So if we continue on in Genesis 45 and seven, it says, and God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So we see a physical salvation. We see a lot of people coming to Joseph in Genesis 47 and 25. So they said, you have saved our lives. Let us find favor in the sight of my Lord and we will be Pharaoh's servants. This is all of Pharaoh's servants coming to Joseph saying, you saved us. Like, this is a big deal. In Genesis 50 and 20, it says, but as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day, as it is this day to save many people alive. So it wasn't just the brothers that were, you know, that benefited from the salvation. A lot of different people were depending on Egypt for that food. And I went into a commentary, um, the Jameson Fawcett Brown Bible Commentary. It says the famine was sore in all lands, that is the lands contiguous to Egypt, Canaan, Syria, and Arabia. So that's a real big region of people that benefited from Joseph taking that viceroy position. And salvation was known to those people through Egypt and through Joseph. So even though we're not, you know, today we don't call Joseph the savior and things like that. But to those people, I'm sure that they acknowledge some type of, I don't know if they wanted to call him a prophet or something, but everybody knew Joseph was responsible for this because of the power that Pharaoh had given him. And what we don't see, we don't see no sacrifices, no blood, nobody prayed in Joseph's name, nobody converted or was baptized. The people simply acknowledged Joseph saved them. So why is he not recognized as a savior, right? Genesis 41 and 57 says, so all countries came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain because the famine was severe in all lands. So they knew where to go and they knew who to get it from. So this is basically the, the, the concept of a savior in the Tanakh so far. We didn't deal with Noah, saved his family from a flood. We dealt with Abraham, saved Lot from um, a, a, a war. Basically he was kidnapped in a war. Um, Joseph is saving <laughs> the people of Egypt, Canaan, Syria, and Arabia, a huge amount of people, all savers in the Tanakh. But the average person, if you ask them to name a savior, in, if you just say name a savior in the Bible, the only one that's going to come to mind is you, you know who. So it's very interesting that this, this, this topic is not brought out more. And um, this is one of the reasons I chose it. So um, 
in the Psalms 14, 7, it says, Oh, that the salvation of Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord brings back the captivity of his people, let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. So we see even in the future, the concept of salvation is not going to be somebody just preaching to the people to make them feel good. It's going to be with actual captivity being reversed and Israel rejoicing and Israel being glad. So when the people are back in their land, their fortunes are restored, this is going to be some physical concepts. So this, this is like, it's prevalent throughout the whole Tanakh. In Psalm 50 and 23, I went through some different versions and I, I wanted to see how this was translated. It says, whoever offers praises glorifies me and to him who orders his conduct or right, I will show him the salvation of God. There's no sacrifices there. There's no blood. It just says, whoever offers praises to me. <laughs> that <laughs> Sometimes the Tanakh can be very, very simple when, when you just got to read it. We don't have a temple. We don't, we don't have the priest to, to go take no sacrifices because everybody asks that. How do you get forgiven for God? How do you get salvation without a temple? Were you, were, are you burning sacrifices in your backyard? I get asked the, the craziest questions. It says right here, whoever offers praises glorifies me and to him who orders his conduct aright." right. Now, this is the New King James Version. In the regular King James Bible, it says, who, whoso offereth praises glorifieth me and to him that ordered his conversation aright right will I show the salvation of God. So the, the first one says your conduct is like behavior, but this one says your conversation, how you speak. The New International Version says, those who sacrifices, those who sacrifice thanksgiving offerings, I'm sorry, those who sacrifice thank offerings honor me, and to the blameless, I will show my salvation. So we got conduct, we got conversation, and now we got somebody being blameless. The New Living Translation says, but giving thanks is a sacrifice that truly honors me, but if you keep to my path, I will reveal to you the salvation of God. So now we got Derek Hashem, keeping to the path. So we got keeping to the path, being blameless, conversation, and conduct, according to these translations, as a way for God to show us his salvation. That right there, <laughs> that nullifies the whole blood concept right there. I mean... And Psalms is such a is such a huge book. I don't know why people are just. I don't, I'm not going to say all people, but the, we, we know that there's communities that completely ignore these verses because it doesn't fit with their doctrine. But um, I just wanted to bring that out. Now, what's interesting, like I said in the beginning, is that the brothers were used by the Most High to bring this about, just like God used Pharaoh to show His power. It says in Exodus 9 and 16, but indeed for this purpose, I have raised you up that I might show you my power and you that my name may be declared in all the earth. So when people go against God, they're actually working for him and they just don't realize it. Back in Genesis 15 and 20, but as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about as at this day to save many people alive. So it's interesting that all the people who fight against Hashem are actually <laughs> being employed by him to carry out his will. So in conclusion, before Sinai, the concept of, sa of salvation was physical without the need of blood or anyone dying for you. And we, we already know that this is not even allowed. So another thing that I found when you go through these different translations, some people are more honest than others, even though they have a specific doctrine. But I found that the New Living Translation, which when I looked it up, of course, um, a, a Christian wrote it, but it says in the New Living Translation in Isaiah 66 and 3, but those who choose their own ways, delighting in their detestable sins, will not have their offerings accepted. When such people sacrifice a bull, it is no more acceptable than a human sacrifice. I was like, 
in a Christian Bible, <laughs> it said that? Look it up in the New Living Translation. When such people sacrifice a bull, it is no more acceptable than the human sacrifice. So some people, they can, they can tell the truth in, in certain instances. It says when they sacrifice a lamb, it is as though they sacrifice a dog. When they bring an offering of grain, they might as well offer the blood of a pig. When they burn frankincense, it is as they have blessed an idol. That's the whole verse. But it is no more acceptable than a human sacrifice. So when did that change? If, if a human sacrifice is not acceptable, when exactly did that change? So that's pretty much what, all I had on Joseph. Um, of course, I'm going to be dealing with a lot of different people going forward. Um, I have a, a book series on clouds.com. I got videos on YouTube. Um, my books are on amazon.com as well, the false fulfillment citation series. You can email me at Davon Mays at clausatora.com. And that's all I have for Joseph today. So now we can open up the floor to questions. If anybody got any questions.